Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. I am Justin Essary, an Associate Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic, online, interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake Forest University and Springer Publishing, and previously sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speakers are Nadia Liu of Princeton University and Bryce Dietrich of the University of Iowa. Springer's new series, Textbook on Political Analysis, is accepting submissions for applied texts on topics and political methodology. Uh, I just took over editing this series, so you can speak to me or Springer editor Lorraine Klimowicz for more information about the scope of the series or how to submit a proposal. And I will post a link to that contact information in the Zoom chat window after this introduction. We are currently hosting a special series of presentations originally slated for the 2020 annual meeting of the political, uh, Midwest Political Science Association that was canceled due to the outbreak of COVID-19. Each session will, last, uh, will host two talks, each lasting 20 to 25 minutes each, followed by 10 to 20 minutes for Q&A. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. And you may ask questions at any time during the talk, but those questions will be held until the end of the talk. A link to each presenter's slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation, and I will uh, post those slides right after this introduction. Our uh, first presentation will be from uh, Nadia Liu uh, from Princeton University, uh, presenting a talk entitled A Latent Factor Approach to Missing Not at Random. Nadia, welcome. Thank you, Justin. Oh, hi, I'm Nigel from Princeton, and today I'm very excited um, to share with you my project towards missing not at random. So just to uh, motivate the whole project a little bit, we see missing values a lot, uh, especially in observational data sets. Um, and then we deal with missing values by deploying different kinds of imputation methods. And then when we use those methods, we actually make assumptions towards the missing mechanism. So for example, the earliest um, multiple, uh, the earliest imputation method that scholars usually choose is list-wise deletion, where we just get rid of all the observations with any missingness in the data set. And by doing so, we actually assume uh, missing completely at random, where we're saying there's no mechanism that's driven, that's driving the missingness in this data set. And you can think about it as if you're spilling coffee onto your data sheets and everything is completely random. But even in that scenario, um, those variables that were closer to your coffee marks might be more likely to go missing. So again, uh, missing completely at random is a very strong assumption to make. So then scholars resorted to the second kind of assumptions, which is called missing at random, where we're saying the missing values and the observed values should be very similar to each, to each other. Um, by assuming missing at random, we will be able to impute the missing values using the observed values. And this is um, usually called multiple imputation methods. So for this method, um, I will show you an application using a Chinese survey data set in China. So again, these are Chinese people being surveyed in China where they were asked to self-report um, their ideology. And the question is um, in seven category from extreme left to extreme right. Um, so I claim that um, the missingness in this question is a violation of uh, missing at random. Because in the Chinese context, people with more extreme ideologies would feel unsafe to report uh, their ideology. So again, this question has a refusal option for respondents. So then this leads us to the third scenario of missing mechanism, which we call missing not at random. So we're saying the information that we can obtain from observed values is not enough for us to impute the missing entries. And this can happen in two scenarios. If we were to have unobserved confounders that's driven, driving the missingness, or um, it can be the censored due to its own value. So if we think about um, education level that's affecting your income level, and education level also affecting, also affect your probability of answering your income level. And unfortunately, if we don't observe education level in the data set, then here we have unobserved confounder problem. But again, uh, in terms of income level, if you have extremely high income, you might be less likely to reveal your income 
to the survey um, questions. So again, this is missing due to its own value. And these two scenarios, we call them missing not at random. So just to formally define uh, missing not at random again, that is just saying probability of missing M given the observed covariance X ops does not necessarily equal to the probability of missing given the full sets of covariance if we were to observe everything. So again, the problem here is that we do not have enough information to impute the missing entry. And by this project, I propose a new method where I want to model the missing pattern so that we can deal with the insufficient information problem. And when I say missing pattern, I really mean the possible combinations of all missing patterns for each observation. So let's say you have five variables uh, in this data set. You can have um, all five of them missing. You can have four out of five missing, three out of five missing, and so on and so forth. So basically, I'm interested in the distribution of all the possible missing patterns in the data set. And I want to use latent factor model to first factorize the missing pattern so that we can kind of capture the unmeasured confounders that are driving the missingness in this data set. So instead of the missing at random assumption that scholars make for multiple imputation methods, here I make a new assumption where I assume the probability of missing given the observed value and the latent factor uh, outcome Z equals the probability of missing given full sets of covariates. And again, I will tell you more in detail how we obtain um, the calculation of this latent factor Z. So let's say we start with a data set um, with some missing values. And then we suspect that the missing can be driven by missing not at random. So the method starts with uh, converting the whole data set into a binary missing matrix M, where one indicates the missing entry and zero indicates observed. So again, now we have a new binary matrix M with the same dimensionality as the original data set. So once we have the binary matrix, we can conduct latent factor model on this matrix to uh, reduce the dimensionality or to factorize the distribution of these binary missing indicators. So here we have a wide range of latent factor models to choose from. And for today's the application, I'm going to use a uh, principal component analysis PCA. Uh, but again, you can choose any kinds of latent factor models such as uh, SVD and latent utility model. And you need to make the trade-off between uh, more assumptions versus more interpretability uh, for certain kinds of latent factor model. And again, I will talk more in the discussion session about the choice of latent factor model and the uniqueness of imputation. So great, once we obtain the uh, latent factor result Z out of the matrix M, we will be able to calculate a pairwise distance for each observation I uh, between everyone else in the data set. And this distance is for now is calculated using a kernel uh, matrix. So basically for this step, I want to know for each observation I, um, who are the similar people with, with observation I in the data set and who are the different ones um, from observation I. So again, for uh, each observation I, I will calculate a vector of pairwise distance uh, dij for all j in the data sets. And this is uh, under, for now, a Gaussian kernel, which I'll talk more in detail later. And you can definitely choose other kinds of kernel if you're comfortable um, with your choice of kernel, depending on the data set and data structure. So once we have the pairwise distance matrix, we will be able to impute the missing entry as a weighted average of all observed values. So let's say for variable x, um, the observation i is missing, so xi is missing, then we will be able to impute xi as a weighted average of all other x that we can observe in the data set. And this weighting, uh, weighting term is actually determined by the kernel distance uh, in step three. So again, here we upweight those people who are more similar to um, this observation and we downweight people who are less similar to the observation. And again, this distance dij is calculated by both the latent factor z and observed data. So here we're utilizing the unobserved confounders and the observed values in this data set. So I want to show you a quick simulation example just to 
see um, intuitively how this method work and how it compares with the multi computation method uh, when missing not at random is true. So here I generated a data set of 2000 observations with 18 variables. Again, I need a sizable data set for uh, both multiple imputation methods to uh, work well and also for latent factor model to have enough uh, columns of binary matrix to capture. Um, and these 18 variables follow a multivariate normal distribution with mild covariances among each other. So again, this is helpful for multiple imputation methods because what they utilize is the observed values and they want to build on the model of all the observed values so that we can predict well the missing entries. So here then I generated a separate set of confounders that are highly correlated to these 18 variables. And also the missingness will be driven by these unobserved confounders. So I have the confounders generated, but I will not include them in the original data set and for any imputation process. So here um, we have missing not at random, and I generated around 30% of missing in the data set. So for comparison purposes, I will also impute um, the missing data set uh, using multiple imputation by chain decretion, which we call MICE. This is a, one of the most commonly used uh, multiple imputation methods by social scientists. Again, MICE assumes um, missing at random. So here we're violating the assumption that MICE needed uh, to work well. So just to quickly reiterate the procedure, I first binarize the whole data set into a missing matrix. Then I conduct PCA to reduce the dimensionality of this binary matrix. And then I calculated the pairwise distance using a Gaussian kernel uh, using both the PCA result and the observed values in the data set. So here I chose the optimal bandwidth for Gaussian kernel using cross-validation. Um, and finally, once we have the pairwise distance, we will be able to conduct imputation by taking a weighted average of all observed variables for each missing entry in this data set. So this graph shows, so I just randomly, I will show you only one uh, result from one variable for visualization purposes. So this graph actually shows, um, if you look at the bottom transparent bar, um, it shows the true distribution when we have no missingness in the, in the data set. Again, I generated this data set myself, and that's why we have the correct distribution of the variable x8. And then the middle bar actually shows the observed value. So this is with, without any imputation, with missing data in it. Um, this is the quantile distribution of the missingness of the observed value. And as you can see, due to missing not at random, we actually dr drastically changed the uh, distribution of this variable. And then the top bar shows the imputation result by mice. So this is the multiple imputation uh, result. So here, due to the missing at random assumption, mice just perfectly replicates the distribution of the observed uh, value. And instead of replicating the true distribution of this uh, variable. And there, there are two points that I want to strike here. So first of all, extreme values are actually very important if we were to conduct linear model, because extreme values usually have higher leverage, uh, and it can tilt your regression line. And as we can see under um, missing not at random, multiple mutation only gives you more power because now we impute um, all the missing entries, but it doesn't have additional benefits because of the wrong distribution that it imputed. And if you look at the purple bar here, this is the latent factor approach. Um, so by, again, by PCA kernel and the weighted average uh, imputation. So I was actually able to replicate better the original distribution of the data set. And again, this is because I don't rely on the missing at random assumption that MICE does. So if simulation um, can partly convince you that the method is working, I then wanna show you an application using the Chinese uh, survey data set. So again, this data set uh, was, the survey was conducted in 2017 uh, among Chinese netizens. And in the survey question, uh, there are around 60 very sensitive questions that were asked and people were um, actually provided with a refu refusal option. So these are really sensitive questions under uh, Chinese context. So I listed some examples here. Uh, questions like, what's your opinion towards Chairman Mao? And does China really need a democracy? How much do you trust village level officials? 
And here I'm going to focus on this question where they were asked to self-report uh, their ideology. And again, among 2,400 respondents, around 600 people refused to answer these questions. So fortunately, we do have a reasonable amount of complete observations um, for this method to work. So again, to reiterate the procedures, I first conduct the principal component analysis on the missing binary indicator matrix. So here I wanna show you a graph where it says um, for each component, um, how many, how much variance uh, the com component explaining in this data set. And I argue that uh, we should always plot um, this variant, variance graph to show that um, latent factor model actually is working because we're actually reducing the dimension into maybe 10. So here again, it's saying with the first 10 components, we capture most of the variances in the data set. And if you see your data set has so almost flat line um, for any kinds of latent factor model, then that's mean, that means your data is not concentrated on the first several components and latent factor model is not contributing anything more uh, by reducing dimensionality. And again, that should be a very rare uh, incidences. And as long as we check this variance graph, uh, we should be confident towards the latent factor model. So again, after PCA, I will calculate the pairwise distance uh, between each observation, and then I will impute the missing entry as a weighted average using the uh, calculated pairwise distance in the previous step. So again, um, I want to first show you the observed distribution of ideology. So here, white bar um, is without any distribution, um, basically, as you can see, more people actually uh, reported themselves to be in the middle category, so less extreme ideology. So again, category one is extreme left, and category seven ex is extreme right. So again, Chinese government uh, tends to censor extreme ideologies, regardless if you're extreme right or extreme left. So then I conducted a naive imputation using mice. So similar to the result in simulation, because of the missing at random assumption, mice just replicates the observed distribution perfectly, almost perfectly. So the purple bar shows you the latent factor approach of imputation, where I predict more uh, people to be on the extreme sides uh, and fewer to be in the middle. So here basically we're saying um, for those people who refused to answer this question, um, they're actually more likely to have an extreme um, ideology. So again, we can conduct further check to see what is the mechanism that's driving the missingness. So as I've mentioned before, in this data set, I have several, I have almost half of the observations that were complete. So that enables me to plot some pairwise correlation between some variables in the data set and the first component of PCA analyses. So again, um, the first component in the PCA is usually the most significant component that covers the most amount of variance um, in the PCA analysis. Analyses. So here the point estimate shows you the pairwise correlation between each variable. Again, these are variables in the data set and with the um, first component of PCA. And the bar is a 95% confidence interval. So I would be cautious in interpreting the sign of this correlation due to the nature of PCA, because if we rotate uh, the first component, we can definitely get the opposite sign. But the significance actually tells us something about um, what are the mechanisms that are driving the missingness. So if you look at these um, variables with significant pairwise correlation. So these are variables like how often do you discuss politics with your friends and family? How much are you interested in politics? How honest do you were answering the above survey questions? What's your education level? How often do you use a VPN to access website outside China? How satisfied you are towards Chinese uh, society? Are you a government worker? What's your gender? And what's your opinion towards DPRK? What's your opinion towards uh, the party? So these variables actually measure uh, political efficacy towards uh, each respondent. And as we can see, this is actually in accordance with a lot of um, comparative politics literature where uh, political efficacy actually affects people's willingness to reveal their true preference. 
So just to wrap up my presentation, I want to talk a little bit more about the scope and limitations of this method. So first of all, um, the latent factor approach actually allows the ex existence of missing completely at random and missing at random. So because I didn't make any explicit um, restrictions that only MNAR is allowed. So if we were to have a perfect missing completely at random situation, then the latent factor step shouldn't provide you with any additional information. So again, there's nothing to learn from the missing pattern in the data set. And we're definitely constrained by data quality. So for example, if we, if we don't have enough number of columns, the late, then latent factor model might not be uh, hand, handy because um, basically if we only have five columns in the data set, um, there's no point to further reduce the dimension. Um, and also sometimes if we have too many uh, observations that contain missingness, um, the kernel estimation step might produce a weight of zero for everyone else and a weight of one for this person. Um, again, this is a good first step because um, we're basically saying uh, we're identifying this person to be fundamentally different from everyone else. But the unfortunate part is that if we were to assign a zero weight for everyone else, then it's almost impossible uh, to impute for this missing entry. So some of you might be worried about um, the uniqueness of factorization. Again, we can choose from a wide range of um, latent factor models, such as PCA, SVD, latent utility, and so on and so forth. So my recommendation is that, um, so you can go ahead and try all kinds of latent factor model that you have in mind, uh, but there's actually a very principled way for us to compare the difference in the kernel distance that we compute. And if you see a drastic difference among the kernels produced by different kinds of latent factor model, then this is an alarming sign saying, uh, maybe there's something else going on. So one way to deal with that is to take average among all imputed data sets. And another way to go is to uh, justify a choice of certain latent factor model by substantive uh, knowledge or data structure. But in most of the cases, for example, in my simulation, I actually tried, we shouldn't see a drastic difference in kernel estimations um, that are coming from different latent factor model. So in that case, um, basically we know the results are robust and we should be able to go ahead uh, with any kinds of latent factor model. So to conclude, I propose a new method um, to deal with missing not at random by um, modeling the missing pattern so that we can uh, deal with the unobserved confounders that are driving the missingness. And this uh, method potentially has a wide range of applications. And here I show you one in sensitive survey questions, but there are many more out there uh, with censored uh, data and things like that. And again, thank you so much for listening and I look forward to your feedbacks. All right, sorry. <laughs> it's taking me a second to switch the camera over. All right, thank you, uh, Nadja, for that presentation. Our second presentation will be from Bryce Dietrich of the University of Iowa, presenting a talk entitled, Has President Trump Changed the Way Americans Talk About Immigration on Twitter? This presentation is based on joint work with Nick Beauchamp, Kaglar Koyulu, Cassandra Tai, and Jiu Yao. Uh, go ahead, Bryce. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, this project is a project that we just recently started, uh, you know, uh, in the last, I guess, a year for a year ago in the fall semester. And generally speaking, um, we know a couple of things about uh, President Trump's Twitter behavior. First, uh, President Trump tweets a lot, and that has been increasing over time. And we also know that oftentimes President Trump tends to tweet uh, seemingly outlandish things about various topics that uh, if you read popular accounts, these tweets have, have a large impact or have an impact on public opinion about these particular issues. Um, so we started with a very basic question of when President Trump tweets things about immigration, uh, which is the focal point of this paper, what sort of effect does those tweets have on the broader discourse within Twitter? Um, so the Probably the, the seminal paper in this area, uh, at least recently, uh, is this fantastic APSR article 
uh, which focuses on issue attention in Congress. And so the, there's a lot going on in this paper. I highly encourage folks read it. Uh, but generally speaking, one of the key findings is that members of Congress tend to respond to popular sentiment, at least in terms of issues uh, that are expressed on Twitter. And then these, and it would give you the impression that members of Congress, at least in the context of issue attention, are simply just gauging what is happening on Twitter and then responding accordingly. Um, so this very much removes the politician from the equation and would suggest that uh, President Trump's Twitter behavior really has no effect on Twitter. Instead, President Trump is just tweeting uh, in response to what is happening on Twitter, and ergo, he's just following a public opinion trend and responding accordingly. So this is at odds with issue framing literature, which has been shown in a lot of different contexts to show that framing effects really do influence the way publics view particular issues like government spending, campaign finance, and foreign policy. Uh, so in this instance, it's not necessarily whether or not President Trump is raising issues on Twitter, but he could be potentially framing issues that arise on Twitter in a particular way that is favorable to him. Uh, so there's generally three processes uh, that influence framing effects, at least as we see it in this context. So one is that when President Trump tweets, he's making uh, new beliefs available about a particular issue. So in that instance, he's tweeting information that does not exist in the current political discussion on Twitter regarding immigration, and ergo, he's, he's inserting those issues into that, that discussion. Secondly, he's making certain beliefs more accessible to people on Twitter, so people who have predispositions that are consistent with his ideology. He tweets about those things in order to trigger those and their evaluations of immigration uh, during his presidency. And then third, uh, he's, he's making beliefs strong in people's evaluation. So in this instance, he's essentially raising the importance of certain immigration issues within people who are interacting with him on Twitter in such a way to make those more prominent in their evaluation of policies. Um, and of course, there's intermediary factors, which is uh, essentially where our preliminary analysis is focused most uh, up until this point. So things like individual predispositions, either partisanship or ideology, which frame the way or which affect the way individuals are susceptible to framing effects when they appear in social media. Source credibility, which also is going to be highly correlated with individual predispositions, because in this instance, the source is President Trump. So the degree to which they feel as though Trump is competent or providing valuable information with respect to immigration. And then finally, accessibility. So the ability for individuals to obtain that information and within Twitter, this, the, this is uh, important because oftentimes uh, tweets are going to be lost within the broader Twitter discussion. And so the question is, does Trump's ability to influence those discussion uh, primarily focus on ensuring that immigration and, and immigration issues that he cares about are always at the top of the forefront within these discussions? So uh, our motivating questions in the study are twofold. So the first is, does President Trump influence the way issues are discussed on Twitter? So I've been, I've been talking a lot about immigration. I'll continue to talk about immigration. But this is just one of the many issues that President Trump engages with on Twitter. And we're interested in whether or not President Trump has a general influence on these discussions, not just with, with respect to immigration. Secondly, what factors, if any, make these uh, issue frames that President Trump is advancing more or less effective? Uh, so these questions are important because uh, the literature surrounding framing, the reason why it's valuable politically is because politicians and uh, presidents want to maintain valuable public opinion. So they want to make sure that the public is, is, views them favorably. And then complex issues arise within Twitter or outside of Twitter, which demand some sort of detention, attention and response from the political figure. And uh, framing is important because it allows those issues to be presented in the best possible light, which is why Jacoby in 2000 says one of the most important tools that political elites have at their disposal is the ability to frame issues, which again runs counter to this idea that members, uh, that presidents are simply just responding to public sentiment on Twitter. But instead, what we're arguing is, is that there actually could be potentially playing a pro proactive framing role with respect to these same discussions. So that's the broad overview. Now I'm going to talk about the data and our methodological approaches, which I assume a lot of folks in this particular setting are interested in. Um, so we have every English language geotag tweet, which contain the following keywords, uh, immigrant, immigration, Islam, Muslim, and refugee. Uh, and this all goes out to Chalar, who is a colleague of mine in the Department of Geography, who's been collecting this data set beginning in December 2016 and is still ongoing. Uh, so we have all tweets 
that are geotagged that fit these keywords since 2016 in the data set that we're using for this study. In total, there are around 100 million tweets of which 56 million are labeled as English by Twitter. And so the reason why there's tildes next to that is that every time I've tried to count these, uh, I keep getting a segmentation fault on our server. So it's, it's likely higher than this, uh, but uh, needless to say, we have a lot of tweets at our disposal and some percentage of those are English language tweets. And we're focusing on English language tweets and the purpose of the study. The second thing that we did is we restricted our data to only tweets that originally originated in the United States. And this was done by obtaining uh, a, a latitude longitude boundary map from uh, ArcGIS and essentially mapping that onto the Twitter data that we have in order to assign it a state. Uh, if it didn't have a state uh, within the United States that it wasn't included in the results that you're seeing today. And then finally, we obtained all Trump tweets from the same time period, which included the same immigration keywords, which was uh, 153 was what we used for the study. So the next question is how do we assess framing effects uh, within Twitter. Uh, so one way to do this is to look at different topics that are used within uh, these tweets that are centered around immigration. So the question is, how do we determine topics? So there's a lot of different ways to do topic modeling. Uh, so the way that we used uh, was to essentially leverage television transcripts to assign topic labels to individual topics using a supervised neural network. Uh, so this is an example of the base data set that we used. Uh, so this is from the LexisNexis uh, API, and uh, it should seem somewhat familiar. So just imagine lots of transcripts uh, that are from uh, major cable news outlets. Uh, at the bottom of this, if you've ever been to LexisNexis, they always have these subject labels uh, at the bottom of each uh, article. So our thought was we can use these subject labels to essentially train a model to then understand what sort of text is associated with keywords like Trump immigration ban or small business or whatever the case may be. So in the first iteration, um, we're not using these percentages directly in the model. I'll explain how the uh, quote unquote accuracy percentages from these topics are used in the model. Uh, but for now, uh, we're not using them directly. And we're assuming that these topic labels are meaningful, at least to LexisNexis. And from our cursory examination of them, they do seem to mirror the topics that appear in the article, but we do need to do some validation in this regard. So uh, we obtained all LexisNexis transcripts for the 2019 Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC broadcast. There's approximately 350,000 of these. In total, there were 5,000 topics identified, uh, around 5,000 topics identified. And of those 70 included at least 5,000 articles, which is the topics that we ultimately use for this study. So uh, trained a custom recurrent neural network with 86% or 86,000 transcripts. The input into the neural networks is word embeddings. 80% of the data was reserved for training, 20% for validation. And the key layer in this recurrent neural network is the long short-term memory network. Uh, because one problem with, uh, one of the benefits of a recurrent neural network is that it has short-term dependencies, meaning that a word embedding at T1 in an article is going to influence the estimation of the word embedding at T2. And so in a textual sense, that's really relevant because we know that text, uh, most articles follow that type of pattern, that if you're, in one, if you're in paragraph one, that is likely going to influence paragraph two. But one of the challenges with a, a vanilla recurrent neural network is that it ignores long-term dependencies. So everything is short-term, meaning that the current paragraph is not necessarily going to be influenced by information at the beginning of the article. So an LSTM layer within a recurrent neural network is, is useful because it essentially also estimates gates at the beginning and end of that layer within the neural network, which essentially filter earlier information. So it essentially estimates weights that say what percentage of the earlier information should be incorporated into this layer within the recurrent neural network. And then finally, the loss function in this model is binary cross entropy. Uh, I'm gonna put that in brackets, happy to talk about that and why we did use categorical cross entropy in this instance. Uh, but ultimately the dependent variable in this instance is going to be a vector of uh, 70 uh, zeros and ones that we're essentially trying to predict using word embeddings from the articles and this recurrent neural network structure. Uh, so here's the topics. Uh, I wish I had more time to kind of leave these up and linger. Uh, but again, uh, these topics were purely selected by which ones appeared most within uh, the corpus. And the reason why we had to do that is because within any machine learning context, if you have essentially rare topics that only appear 1% of the time, then fitting uh, the model becomes really challenging because uh, that particular topic is always going to be
underestimated when it's trained within uh, the neural network. Um, so the performance, so this is the validation accuracy over time. So it essentially settles at around 94% accurate in terms of predicting uh, these 70 topic labels. For those of you who have done these in the past, this should not be too surprising because topics don't appear uh, very often. So it's, if it predicts a whole bunch of zeros, then it's always going to be high accuracy, which is why a more influential measure is the area under the uh, ROC curve. And in this instance, it gets up to 0.89, which is pretty good in terms of this metric. But I can tell you that essentially what this model does is it's really good. Uh, the precision is very high in the model meaning that when a topic is returned, that topic is likely to co coexist, but recall struggles in the model, meaning that it's not necessarily able to recover all instances of a given topic, but we're pretty pleased with this performance. And this was trained over the course of two and a half weeks, uh, give or take, on the servers here at Iowa. Um, so again, the output of this is going to be, instead of a, vectors, uh, a, a vector of zeros and ones, this is gonna be a vector of number of a, uh, decimal that ranges between zero and one about the probability that this topic is observed within that tweet. So in order to estimate the effects of Trump's tweets, um, so the dependent variable that we've been looking at to begin with is this purely the similarity between all of Trump's tweets and all tr tweets that exist within a particular window uh, that surrounds that tweet. And I'll talk about that window here in a second. So similarity in this instance is purely the inverse utility and distance between uh, the vector the, set, the, the vector associated with the topics of tweet A and the vector associated with the Trump tweet. And we did that for all possible combinations. So we created those dyads and then estimated similarity scores using a windowing approach. So uh, the Bayesian model that we estimated has essentially a piecewise quadratic function that happens before and after each tweet at level one. Level two includes covariates such as uh, state and tweet random effects, as well as controls for the hour and the day of the tweet. Uh, and then finally, at level three, we have state effects, which is where we're primarily measuring conservatism at this point, because we don't have individual levels of estimates of conservatism by user. So we only have it for the state. So level three is a state level uh, effects that are a function of a single covariate at this point, which is conservatism, but we're planning on adding more covariates in the past. So in order to show essentially how this model works, we created uh, some simulated data in order to demonstrate that the Bayesian model was actually uh, functioning the way that we anticipated. So in this three by three matrix, uh, the columns essentially represent these uh, quadratic shift terms. So a negative one, a zero and a positive one. And the rows represent the tweets shift in, in, uh, intercept term of negative one, zero and one. So if you look at this cell, what's essentially happening is that, um, that the tweet itself uh, has a negative effect on similarity after the tweet is introduced into uh, the Twitter sphere. And that slope becomes more negative over time because the state level quadratic term is a negative one and the tweet quadratic term is also a negative one. Conversely over in this cell, we have uh, the opposite situation. So here uh, the tweet itself, so the Trump tweet itself had a positive effect on similarity as well as the state. Uh, and the state also had a positive effect, which means that after the tweet was introduced, we see this shift upwards. And then we have variation in between. Um, so generally speaking, um, the, when we estimated using the simul uh, simulated data, we were able to obtain the anticipated values, which demonstrates that the model is working as anticipated. Um, right, so the preliminary analysis that we did. So uh, as I mentioned before, there's 153 Trump tweets. Uh, we created uh, windows of plus or minus 10 hours around each tweet in five minute intervals. So for each interval within that plus and minus 10 hours, we calculated the mean similarity of all tweets to Trump's tweet. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, there are around 19 million other tweets that existed within plus or minus 10 hours of the 153 Trump tweets that we were using for this study. Uh, and there are around 262,000 uh, time interval observations. So as we mentioned before, the question that we're trying to answer is, what is the overall similarity pattern before and after? And what is the effect of state politics on similarity afterwards? Uh, and again, the way that we accomplished this was doing dyadic uh, similarity scores and then aggregating across these intervals in order to get uh, the, uh, the mean similarity scores within each of those levels. 
Okay, so the first result that we'll show is just the grand pooled similarity. So this is not taking into consideration anything related to the uh, anything related to the states themselves. It's purely, uh, or sorry, state conservatism. Instead, it's purely just trying to estimate uh, the effect of a Trump tweet on similarity in general, ignoring anything uh, relative to the state except for the random inters the random effects that we talked about a few slides ago. So if you can see what happens here, essentially what takes place is that when Trump's tweets introduce, you see a kind of a dip in similarity and then similarity rises soon afterwards. Um, and uh, these coefficients here show this kind of curvilinear pattern. Uh, as we'll see, probably the most important coefficient that we'll estimate, at least for this effect, is whether or not this trend leading up to the introduction of Trump tweets explains this variance after the tweet is introduced. And we find very little evidence of this, that this is the case. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, the, after we estimated the first instance of this model, um, the first thing that we said was, well, it could be a time effect. So Trump tweets at odd hours. So it could be that there's, that Trump is tweeting in a particular day and time. And then consequently that's leading to these similarity effects. So uh, we still found the basic result um, that I spoke about before, which is that uh, the Twitter behavior, Twitter similarity leading up to Trump's tweet was not predictive of the behavior after Trump's tweet. So we still found evidence of this, but the pattern of how Trump's tweet affected similarity scores did change to some extent after these time varying coefficients were existing. So instead of seeing this essentially linear increase uh, after a Trump tweet is introduced, Essentially, what we found was a, uh, a sharp peak afterwards, and then it started to dissipate soon thereafter, or, uh, soon thereafter and then it started to uptick uh, shortly after that. And so we saw a much more dynamic pattern than what we saw in the previous slide once the time variant covari covariates were introduced. So um, the betas uh, that we're interested in are ones that, again, the first beta, which is uh, expressed in this statement, so this is uh, the first and third column within our model, or sorry, the first and third row uh, of beta coefficients in our model in the first column. And so what this is trying to estimate is what is the effect of Twitter similarity to Trump's tweet leading up to when Trump's tweets introduced on the behavior that occurs afterwards. And here we find it's essentially zero, which is good for our theory in the sense that it implies that Trump's tweet is having some sort of effect on Twitter, at least at the 30,000 foot level that we're looking at in the context of this study. Uh, the, second co the second set of coefficients that we're interested in are coefficients that essentially determine whether or not after Trump's tweet is introduced, do we see some sort of variance that is a state-by-state -state variance that can be attributed to conservatism. And here we find some evidence, uh, but not necessarily as strong as we would like, and uh, we will explain why we think that is the case uh, towards the end. So uh, generally speaking, we found that more conservative states may have a bigger post-treatment boost, meaning that if the Trump tended, uh, if the state tended to vote for Trump or voted more aggressively for Trump in 2016, that the effect of Trump's tweet was more positive in terms of similarity within that state. And we also found some evidence that uh, the boost may last longer in these states, or it's stickier in the sense that once similarity has been increased in states that tended to vote for Trump those states uh, tended to stay at those kind of inflated similarity scores at, at a longer period of time. So again, we found that once we included uh, the time covariates, uh, we did find uh, additional evidence that the time covariates changed the picture to some extent. Uh, so in this plot, what we're showing is in the pink curve is the overall curve determined by the alpha parameters without any time control. So this is just what is the effect of Trump's tweet within this time, this, this model that includes time, the time covariates. And when that takes place, we can see that uh, Trump's tweet actually kind of decreases the similarity and then it starts increasing. So there's this downward shift after Trump's tweet is introduced into the data set or into the Twitter sphere. And uh, that similarity then starts to increase shortly thereafter. We also found some evidence again, that conservative states were essentially more sticky within in this regard where Essentially, the red line is conservative states. The blue line are uh, liberal states. And this, again, is based on voting records, uh, the percentage of the vote that Trump received within that state in 2016. And the same effect is essentially happening within both states. But we find that uh, conservative states, you have a, a bump up in the, in, in the intercept. And we also find that it takes longer for that, uh, that curve to approximate zero. Um, and so adding time controls uh, tended to fit our overall expectations a little better. 
Um, and we did find evidence that state conservatism uh, also led to kind of a slightly longer lasting boost as well as a higher boost in similarity scores for Trump. So uh, again, uh, what we've done thus far is just a very uh, general overview of what we think uh, is a potential mechanism for Trump to influence Twitter discussions with respect to immigration. Uh, so the first future directions that we're trying to do in this project is first we need longer MCMC -MC chains. So we did 10,000 iterations, but we actually want to increase that in order to ensure that the parameters are uh, stabilized. Uh, the second is that we want to expand the time window. So it definitely seems like there's going to be more interesting dynamics if you look around 10 hours. The reason why we looked at 10 hours to begin with was because uh, we uh, estimated an initial version of this model, which essentially used uh, a Cox proportional hazard model to determine how quickly a given state returned to a level of similarity prior to when Trump's tweet was introduced. And in that model, it seemed like the general effect lasted less than 10 hours. So we decided to start this, uh, the, the Bayesian model at that same interval because of what we saw in the observational analysis. Uh, but we want to expand that. Uh, the second phase of research is to look at different topic areas. Uh, so we have 70 topics. A lot of those are going to be, uh, can be lumped together into common themes. So we're interested in whether or not the certain topics are even more stickier in uh, conservative states versus liberal states and whether or not Trump's uh, effect on Twitter is more pronounced in some topic areas related to immigration versus other. Uh, also, we wanna look at county level data. So as the state level data was the easiest for us to work in at this point in the study, but we also have paired it with a uh, county level. Uh, we've also tagged the tweets with the counties within the United States. And so we should be able to get more refined measures of conservatism or Trump vote share, as well as other variables at the county level that will help influence the model. And then finally, uh, phase three is to think about external events and competing uh, opinion leaders. So external events are important because we know that things like the travel bans certainly likely influence discussions of immigration on Twitter. So we wanna to try to add covariates within our, the Bayesian model to essentially account for uh, uh, kind of uh, another boost being added to uh, Twitter discussions relating to immigration that are these external events which Trump is tweeting about simultaneously. And then also we need to have competing opinion leaders, not just because we wanna know how uh, organizations like the New York Times or CNN influences Twitter discussions as well, but also will better help us better understand what Trump's effect is. Because right now we see Trump in, in essentially a box and we have no sense about whether or not Trump is different from other influential players on Twitter that might have similar number of followers or, uh, or the like. Um, and then finally, I think that our initial results have really led us in our more recent discussions about this project is the thinking about this as more of a polarization story. So instead of Trump uh, essentially putting his thumb on the entirety of uh, the Twitter verse with respect to immigration discussions, it could be that Trump introduces a tweet within Twitter um, and it creates a uh, two different strands of discussions that are polarized diametrically, which would partially explain why there's this decrease in similarity that it happens immediately after Trump's tweet, because it could be that the people who are opposed to Trump's tweet or who are advancing this counter message to Trump's tweet that is diametrically opposed are going to be more vigorous in their efforts as opposed to Trump's supporters on Twitter or people who are tweeting things that are very similar uh, to Trump. So uh, I think we are very interested in, in this project. Hope you are too, but we certainly have a lot of work to do. Um, if you want any more information, you can follow me on Twitter or you can email me directly. Happy to discuss this and really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. And uh, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Bryce, very much for that presentation. <clears throat> At this point, our presenters are available to take questions from the audience. And you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of the webinar window. We've already had quite a few questions come in, so I'll just start uh, going down the list. Uh, I believe this one is for Nadia from an anonymous attendee. It is uh, standard to compare aggregate means and standard deviations between observed and imputed information. I would be interested in one additional comparison uh, between the known or observed respondent statements and those predicted by the PCA imputation. Uh, that would likely be a rate of misclassification. So I guess that's more of a comment than a question, but I would be interested to hear what you think of that idea now, Joe. Yeah, no, um, thank you for the question. So I guess, um, first of all, I want to say imputation method, or my uh, imputation method is not a predictive 
model. So it might be hard to just predict everyone in the data set and see how um, misclassification rate is, uh, because I really need the help of observed values to impute, and so does uh, multiple imputation uh, method. So however, for the similar si uh, simulation result that I showed you guys, I actually have simulation results for a categorical variable as well. And for a categorical variable, um, the latent factor model really has a way better uh, classification rate uh, compared to multiple imputation, because it's just easier for um, latent factor model to put people into um, let's say five categories instead of a continuous uh, range of values. So yes, um, I I believe that that would be a really interesting exercise to run, um, but I would need to think more in terms of how I can predict the values if we were not to observe anything, like if we just also hide the observed values in the data set as well. Um, a couple of questions came in for Bryce that I think are essentially uh, the kind of versions of the same question or even almost exactly the same question uh, from Walter Medbane and um, Absra Peter. Uh, and so Walter says, if 60% of Trump's followers are bots, how do your data and estimated effects relate to human public opinion? And then uh, Absra Peter uh, said, did you factor for the influence of bots and also uh, foreign influence? Um. No, so so the bots. I'm really glad the bots uh, bots point was brought up. Uh, that's a fantastic idea, and this is clearly something that we need to do. Um, uh, we haven't thought about this much uh, at this point. Um, I mean, my initial reaction is that the 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 random effects associated with the tweets themselves should hopefully deal with some of that. But uh, a great point, and certainly something that we'll do shortly. I actually, um, so of course I've heard stories about uh, bots on Twitter being uh, kind of promoting certain narratives or disinformation. Bryce, just with your familiarity with the data, what's your sort of shoot from the hip ballpark estimate of how much of that traffic on uh, in response to Trump is bot driven? Um, you know, it's difficult for me to say off the top of my head, um, but I will say that yeah, I mean, it's 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 difficult for me to think about what that would look like in terms of the way that we're measuring it. So, you know, if a bot is uh, directly quoting Trump, then obviously that is problematic for a score that's essentially just saying whether or not the language is similar or the topics are similar in one tweet or another. If there's something more nuanced that the bots are accomplishing within Twitter, then I think it would be interesting to see how um, that is reflected in the, the topic similarity that we've been looking at. Um, yeah, so uh, I, great point. Uh, we will definitely look at it. Uh, another really quick question from Jay McCann for Bryce. Uh, are you looking only at tweets and not retweets? Uh, so right now it's just tweets, but um, I think we should incorporate look at retweets separately. Um, for the most part, what we've been dealing with is trying to trying to estimate this topic model with a really large corpus and then applying mm -hmm. it to an even larger Twitter corpus in an efficient manner. And then uh, trying to figure out what we think this Bayesian model should look like. Um, and so, yeah, I think that retweets and tweets uh, should likely behave differently. Uh, and right now, we've not been looking at those differences, but I will make a note of it. Uh, for Nadia, um, this is from uh, How You Shy. I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, you mentioned in the presentation, Nadia, that the missingness was set at about 30% for your simulation test. Has this been varied? That is, have you examined the relative efficiency loss and gain with respect to the extent of non-random missingness? Uh, and also, what about character? For example, concentration of missingness in uh, certain few variables. Yeah, no, um, thank you so much for the question. So I definitely did vary the percentage of missingness. Um, so because of the time problem, I should have shown uh, more graphs. But the intuition is if the percentage of missing uh, increases a lot, then we'll be forced to choose a wider bandwidth for the Gaussian kernel, for example. So then the accuracy of the weighted average would decrease. 
So yes, um, if we have higher percentage of missing, we definitely uh, lost a lot of accuracy and efficiency in terms of imputation. And in terms of uh, concentration of missingness, so um, if I understand it correctly, if you're talking about certain observation could have 90% uh, missing versus uh, some other people would have uh, only 10 or 5% missing. So actually, if we have a larger variation in terms of the concentration for each observation, this will actually help a latent factor model to um, further conduct uh, dimension dimensionality reduction. And if everyone is missing um, two or three variables, um, and hopefully there are different variables, then latent factor model can still work. And the worst scenario would be everyone is missing exactly the same variable. So we have completely empty columns. And unfortunately, um, this method will not work under that scenario. And most of the imputation methods uh, will not work either. I think um, the question about efficiency, I mean, it's, I think most people are going to accept that the more missingness you have, the worse it's going to do. But I think the real question is, uh, it's a bias variance trade-off issue because, you know, for example, the uh, mice method might have some issues with accurate prediction, but if it's making a lower variance prediction when there's less data available, that could actually be better than uh, a PCA-driven method or some other, you know, latent factor method. In the event, uh, in the event that um, its variance just goes nuts as you start to lose more data, I think I think that was the spirit of the question. Do you have any insight about that? Yeah, definitely. So that's also a great point. So let's talk about. So let's say if both multiple mutation and latent factor are biased, but multiple mutation produces smaller variance estimation, then it's actually more dangerous to report that confidence interval. Because let's think, if there is a truth and then your point estimate is away from the truth, we at least want a wider uh, confidence interval. So maybe we're more likely to cover the truth with the confidence interval. So if we have too narrow interval or too small standard variance, uh, standard error estimation, then we basically will encounter the overfit problem where uh, your your confidence interval actually doesn't cover the truth. So again, um, um, we don't want to be overconfident about the imputation result. Um, I have a question uh, for Nadia actually about the um, comparing uh, not to mice, but to um, a, a structured missingness model that you might set up, for example, as part of a Bayesian estimation, right? You can mm -hmm. build a a missingness model such that the probability that an observation is missing is dependent on its own value, right? Sort of, sort of in the spirit of like a Heckman model kind of. Um, how does your uh, latent factor model do with comparison to that kind of structural model? Yeah, no, that's also also, also a good question. So um, if you are comfortable with making uh, assumptions, for example, using Heckman selection model, um, and then I would definitely say, do that instead of the latent factor model, because here I'm trying to go as assumption free as possible. Um, but again, we trade on in some biases and some uncertainty estimation with the latent factor step. Um, so I actually have another paper where I kind of borrow the selection idea. And actually, I show that by using the selection or by modeling the select selection part, we can actually correct the uh, regression coefficient estimate and the standard error estimate. So again, this paper, I'm more interested in giving you a correct distribution of each variable. Uh, but if you're thinking about a better inference, so for example, for linear regression coefficient, uh, there are definitely other ways to do so. Well, uh, we've uh, reached the end of our time, so I'd like to first thank uh, Nadia Liu and Bryce Dietrich for being our presenters this week. Uh, their presentations will be posted to our website shortly after this broadcast if you'd like to share them with a colleague or watch them again later. I'd also like to invite you to join us next week, uh, Friday, June 19th, when we will host a talk entitled Stop Making These 10 Text Analysis Mistakes by Ken Benoit of the London School of Economics. Please see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, to get more information about that talk. Uh, Nadja and Bryce, thanks for being here today. Um, uh, all audience members, thanks for being here today, and I hope to see everybody next week. Thank you.